Karin Hogersum, and I'm the president of SUNY Sullivan, and I wanted to offer to you the very warmest welcome. We are so pleased to work with uh, Sullivan Renaissance, and Sullivan Renaissance has again given us this wonderful gift of, 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 of really great speaker today, so we're very excited about that. Before I do the rest of my welcome, I would like to introduce all of you to our student body president, Rochelle Walker, and she's going to also say a few words. Thank you. Again, I would like to welcome you all to SUNY Sullivan. As a student here, I can attest to the fact that this institution prides itself on providing a holistic education, meaning that along with our academics, we hold many events and activities on campus that help reduce well-rounded students such as our sports, our clubs, the Honors Program, the Student Government Association, and events like today's. I'm honored that Savante Myrick is speaking here today to us because he is a role model and inspiration to us all. And thank you all for coming to SUNY Sullivan for today's event. I also thank the Sullivan Renaissance for helping us. Again, welcome to SUNY Sullivan, and I hope you have a great time. Speaking of another up-and-comer, we have one, too. Okay. So it has been a pleasure for us to develop our working relationship with the Sullivan Renaissance, and we really are moving forward together to, to have a bright future for Sullivan County. Sandra Gary, the founder of Sullivan Renaissance, believes that residents can use flowers and gardens to enhance the appearance of Sullivan County while building community pride and spirit. The importance of beautification has long been considered a fundamental component of tourism-related economic development. Now completing its 14th year, Sullivan Renaissance has grown into a year-round community development program involving thousands of volunteers from all 15 towns in the county. In addition to grants for beautification efforts, Sullivan Renaissance has programs that work directly with municipalities, businesses, and seasonal communities. There are also yearly conferences, monthly educational seminars, opportunities for volunteers, and summer internship programs for youth. There are scholarships, including a scholarship to SUNY, SUNY Sullivan. We're so grateful for that. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming the founder of Sullivan Renaissance, a true Renaissance woman herself, one of the loveliest women I've ever met in my entire life, Sandra Gary. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Dr. Hilgerson. And especially thank you for making the SUNY Selig Theater available to us for our very first Sullivan Renaissance Forum. We are grateful to be able to partner with you to provide a suitable space for all the young people here today. Thank you all for joining us. You are in for a special treat this afternoon with our esteemed speaker. Last August, I was drawn to an interesting article in the New York Times about one of the youngest mayors in the U.S. history with an important story to tell. I immediately thought he would be perfect as our keynote speaker for the Sullivan Renaissance Annual Conference and Expo to be held tomorrow morning in the CBI building in Ferndale. After meeting with him, I realized he had a meaningful message for the many young people of Sullivan County. And that is why we have invited you here today. Savantai Myrick has an incredible story to tell, important life lessons he has learned and put into practice, and some amazing ideas how to marry optimism and hope with practical approaches and workability. I trust you will enjoy his remarks this afternoon and leave you inspired. Let's give a warm welcome to the mayor of Ithaca, Savante Myrick. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. My name is Savante Myrick, and I, I want to thank um, I want to Garrett and the Garrett Foundation and the Sullivan Renaissance. Ms. Um, Garrett truly is beautiful inside and out, and what she's striving to do, what she's accomplishing, is something that I think this entire community can be proud of. And I want to thank you, too, for agreeing to the terms of my talk. I said, I'll talk 
but I'm going to need like 200 flowers <laughs> before I can go on. And she said, I think we can do that. So that's very nice. Thank you. I'll be taking all of these home with me. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, if I could, tell you a little bit about my favorite subject, uh, which is myself. That's every politician's favorite subject, right? I want to talk to you about myself, if I could. I want to talk to you about uh, you, about young people, and about the importance of, of uh, your action in our government. I'm going to try to sell you. I'm going to try to pitch you, so get ready. I'm going to try to convince you to run for office. Any office, except mayor of Ithaca. <laughs> all right, that one's taken. All right? But any other office. And I'm going to tell you why that's important. If I could, and then we'll open it up for questions. And I want to tell you about myself. And I want to tell you why it's such a particular pleasure for me to be here um, today. I am now 26 years old, which I know what you're thinking. You're very old. I know. Um, 26 years old. And about 20 years ago, <laughs> I was, uh, I was homeless. My mother and my three siblings, it was the five of us total, were living in our car. We then moved into a homeless shelter where we lived for months. Then back into the car and a cycle that repeated itself for, uh, for quite some time. Now here I am, 20 years later, the mayor of Ithaca, and the graduate of an, of an Ivy League university. And I get the question a lot from people. They say, uh, how? how did this happen? When, when people meet me, they say, how did that happen? Usually because they don't believe that I'm actually the mayor. <laughs> Usually they say, what did, you, uh, what did you win a raffle or something? How, did you, how does it work in your city? Well, I want to tell you how it happened. Uh, and I want to tell you about myself if I could. Now, there are two particular ways to tell this story. I'm going to tell it uh, the first way. This is the way that I uh, like, because the first story is the story of a little boy, about five years old, living in homelessness, but starts school and makes a choice in school to work hard, to do his homework, right? to rise above and exceed and excel uh, at everything that he can. It works so hard through high school, getting internships and jobs, that he's able to get into Cornell University, get an Ivy League school where he continues to work three part-time jobs to pay his way through college, uh, get elected to the city council at age 20 through sheer force of will, determination, charisma, attractiveness. <laughs> you guys know this. If you want to just shout it out, any of them? Humor personality, right? Get elected at 20 years old, served for four, just four years, and then responding to a groundswell of support, run for mayor at age 24, and win in dominating fashion. Right? And once I won, I took office. The city that was facing the largest budget deficit at $3 million that it had ever faced. A city that was looking increasingly drab, shabby, run down. City study that hadn't been reinvested in in four decades. Morale in the public and in the staff that was a record low. Stagnated uh, development, high unemployment, and a culture of um, cynicism. We've turned that around in just two short years. Not only did we close the budget deficit, but we did it with the lowest tax increases in over 15 years. My two budgets had the lowest tax increases. Right. We close the deficit, we're encouraging over $200 million worth of private growth that's in the ground now in the city of Ithaca. We're rebuilding our entire downtown to make it more beautiful. The, the morale in the staff is higher, the morale of the public is higher. Right. Crime is down, and our unemployment rate is now the lowest in all of New York State. All right, thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> yes, please. By the way, if ever you feel the need to interrupt me with spontaneous applause or laughter. I will break for that. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, stop, stop. Keep going. Keep going. No, 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 stop. That's a compelling story. Why is that a compelling story? Why do I like that story? Why? Well, because it makes me sound good, right? It makes me sound like the hero of my own story. But I also 
Those stories are easy to tell because that is the way we are used to hearing our stories in this country. We are used to hearing stories of individuals facing hardships who accomplish great things, who change the world. We're taught that even in elementary school. That's the way we understand our stories in this country. We're just coming out of February, which is what? Anybody? Black History Month. Thank you. It's also the shortest month. The snowiest month. In the snowiest month. Right. So it's Black History Month in February. Who do we learn about? Watch this. Who do we learn about in Black History Month? Martin Luther King Jr. Did you hear that? What are the odds that I could ask that question? The millions of black Americans alive now and who have ever lived, how is it that one individual is who we think of when we think of the story of black American history? Why? Because that's the way we learn our history. What did Dr. King do? He delivered civil rights. How did he do it? What was he famous for? Say it, you know. I have a dream speech. How's that for a story? The guy gave a speech and we got civil rights. That's a hell of a speech. Right? That's a high bar. Right. But it's also, in February, we also had President's Week. President's Week where uh, we celebrate the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. What did Abraham Lincoln do? Free the slaves. Yeah. How? how? The Emancipation Proclamation. Got issues in a proclamation, no more slavery. That's a hell of a proclamation. That's the way we understand these stories. But what if we revisit those stories? What if we actually look at the truth of the life of this country? If you look at the true life of Abraham Lincoln, who was a great man and a great leader, but not a perfect one. Somebody who uh, would not have abolished slavery, said it himself, would not have abolished slavery had it not been for the Civil War. He was only the last abolitionist and a line of abolitionists that went back over 200 years, thousands of people who spent their entire lives working and pressing and sometimes gave their lives in the name of abolition. They were the reason that Abraham Lincoln was in a, even in a position to issue a proclamation. They were the reason why my ancestors were freed from bondage and I had the opportunity to pursue a life of, of fulfillment and satisfaction. Same is true for, for Dr. King. A great man and a great leader, but even himself admitted a flaw. He was one of only millions who were fighting not for weeks or for months, even for years, but for centuries for civil rights and equal rights in this country. And the fight continues beyond him. That's the truth of our stories. And if we don't understand the truth of our stories, then we can't learn the right lessons from them. And it's so important that we learn the right lessons from these stories, because what do you call a lesson that comes from a story? What do you call that? A moral. Who said it? Anybody wants extra credit? Extra credit. Back then. <laughs> the moral. The lessons we learn from our stories are our morals. Think about that. That's where we get our morals. So if we're telling the wrong stories, how would we ever have the right morals? Without the right morals, we can't lead the right lives. So I want to tell you about myself again. Why? Because I like to talk about myself. But because I want to tell you the true story. And the true story starts with that five-year-old boy again, living in that homeless shelter. But he's not the hero now. The hero is his mother, a woman who worked three jobs while raising four children to give us a chance to climb out of poverty. The hero is her parents, my grandparents, retired school teachers had a pension, not a pension lavish enough to buy a boat or a second home, but a pension was enough so that they could put space heaters in their basement. So that when we left the homeless shelter, we could live downstairs, and they could buy sneakers so we could go to the first day of school without being ashamed of our hand-me-down clothes. But when we got to school, we were met by a system that gave us a free lunch and free breakfast, not because they owed it to us, and not because they felt charitable, but because they understood that I couldn't focus on my math homework if I was worried about the rumble in my stomach. At school, too, I had teachers who taught me lessons I will never forget, even if at the time I didn't appreciate the morals of those lessons. I had a math teacher, Mr. Leinbach, and uh, I hated him at the time. You know, I hated him because no matter 
It didn't matter if you got the question right, if you had the right answer on the question. If he could tell that you erased anything on your paper, anything, he would take points off. Right? You had to just strike lines to any work that you didn't want. And you know why? He didn't want you to erase anything? He said, because you could learn from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. That's something that, if I hadn't learned that lesson at 16, there's no way I'd be standing up here now. There's Mr. Manwarren, my music teacher, who uh, uh, I was a drummer. And uh, I was not particularly talented, but I was very enthusiastic. And uh, on our first day, I learned the music beforehand, and I came in, and I played on the snare drum as loud as I could. And afterwards, I said, Mr. Manwarren, did I play well? And he said, uh, you, you played loud. <laughs> you played loud. I said, loud is good. He said, well, not always. Sometimes the best way to make music is to fit in with the people around you, right? to find harmony. Another great lesson. I learned from uh, Coach Rodriguez, my soccer coach, who would make us run wind sprints in August for an hour, right? 100 degree weather. I learned from him uh, that I do not like soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to play anymore. <laughs> So I quit, Mr. Rodriguez, so thank you. But even that's a valuable lesson. You know, you learn your limits. You learn what you can do and what you can't do. All of those people, a system that, that believed in me, a system that pushed me. I even owe my brothers, my older brothers and my younger sister, a debt of gratitude for teaching me lessons in humility. Siblings are great for this. Anybody have siblings? Yeah, do they keep you humble? Yeah. Both my brothers were great athletes. My brother, oldest brother, still holds every football record in my school. Touchdowns, interceptions, catches, uh, you name it. I, on the other hand, was short, had asthma. I was nearsighted, right? So I read a lot of books, right? Okay. So when I took the SATs and I did well enough uh, to go to college, I, I called him right away and I told him what my score was. And he, because he's my big brother and because he loves me, he says, um, well, so what, nerd? He <laughs> said, why don't you call me when, when you have 100 people in front of you uh, there just to see you? Uh, so I have my camera here. <laughs> and uh, if you could all do me a favor and just wave for my brother and tell him, uh, you can tell him to eat it. OK, ready? On the count of three. <laughs> One, two, three. Eat it. Uh, that's, very nice. that's very nice. OK, good. Uh, man, you blinked in the back, so can we... <laughs> I'll tag you guys later. Basically. Um, I learned those lessons, and I went to Cornell, and I did work three part-time jobs. I didn't make that part up. I worked three part-time jobs at Cornell. And working three part-time jobs, all at minimum wage, you will make about $15,000 a year. $15,000 a year. Now, do any of you know how short you're going to be on tuition at Cornell University? If you only make $15,000 a year, yeah, well short is the answer. So how did I get through? I got through with state grants, federal aid, donations from alumni, people who gave not because they had to, not because they had an obligation to, not because they would ever see a direct return on their investment because I still to this day have not met most of these people. They gave because uh, they felt an obligation to pay it forward. That's how I got to and got through Cornell, through the charity and the good intentions of caring people all shouldering their share of the load. And the same thing happened when I was elected to office. When I became mayor, I was surrounded by a community of people that were ready to help me succeed. I worked hard to get elected. I knocked on, nobody had ever done this before in the city's history. Nobody had ever knocked on every voter's door. But I was younger than all of my opponents, right? So I felt maybe I had to do it. So I went around and I knocked on every voter's door in the entire city of uh, Oakland. That's about, that's about 8,000 doors. I still have, oh yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'll pay you later. And uh, I still had time left in the election. So you know what I did? I did it again. I knocked on every voter's door twice. I still had two months until election time. So I tried to do it again. I didn't make it all. I made it two and a half 
times around the city, two and a half times around the city, knocking on all these doors. Now that sounds like um, a story of perseverance and energy. And in some ways it was. I lost 15 pounds, which is nice. So if any of you are looking for a diet, uh, run for mayor. Again, not in Ithaca. You know, I find you on the city. Um, but I had 100 volunteers, 100 volunteers, who went out every single day, and together we knocked down every door in the city 17 times. 17 times. It was a level of voter outreach folks in the city had never seen before. In fact, people were really, really annoyed. <laughs> they were like, if you interrupt my dinner one more time, I'm not going to vote for put it for the vote. I won not because of my own work, but because of those 100 volunteers. Why is it important that I remember this story? Why is it important that I tell myself this story every day instead of the earlier story that makes me sound so good and smart and charismatic and good looking? You know, I'm shouting. Right? Why is it important that I remember the true story? Because the true story is the one that has the right moral in it. The right moral is we can only accomplish great things. Any of us can only accomplish great things if we have the support of our community. Why do we have to remember that? Because only if we remember that do we remember what our obligations are, what my responsibility is, what your responsibility is, is to now become a part of that community that cares for those who we are raising together. You have to become, we cannot wait for, because it's not the way the world works, we cannot wait for Dr. King to come along and save you. We cannot wait for Abraham Lincoln to come along and free us. We cannot work to fight uh, to get Barack Obama elected or Mitt Romney elected and then go home to our homes while uh, the president changes our country. Only we can change our country. That's the only way our country has ever been changed or saved. It is up to us. There's nobody coming to save us. And that's why I want to talk to you specifically about why it's important to run for office. Now, how many of you ever considered running for office? Yeah? All right. Not that many of you. We need to, yeah? I mean, he's wearing a tie, so I knew it. I know. Um, how many of you would never run for office? If you think politics is lame, government sucks. Yeah. Well, um, politics is often lame. And government sometimes sucks. But to not run for office for those reasons is like refusing to plant flowers because your community is too ugly. Or refusing to plant trees because the air is too polluted. When something's broken, that is your opportunity to fix it. And you can fix it. I'm telling you, I'm in my seventh year of elected office. I was elected to the city council when I was a junior. And I'm telling you that young people have exactly what we're missing right now. It is exactly what our government needs. Now, you may be thinking, well, I don't have experience. I'll tell you this. The one thing we have in government and loads is experience. And it has not served us to date. Experience is great. With experience comes shortcuts and cheats and, and ways to get some things done faster. Right? If you know your way around the block, you can get around the block quicker. But there's something that youth have, even though it's not experience. Young people have three things that we badly need. You have energy, you have creativity, and you have a moral authority. And those things are lacking in our government right now at just about every level. You have energy. Some of you don't believe that. I think the way sleeping right there. Um, some of you don't believe that. And you think, if I have so much energy, why am I so tired? How many of you were up past 2 in the morning last night? Okay, see? Now, if I were up past 2 in the morning, I'd be asleep right now. Okay, I would need my nap. But you, young people, have the energy that you need to tackle the largest problems that we face because the problems we're facing, even in the city of Ithaca, are problems uh, that require long nights, early mornings, long days. It requires knocking on everybody's door two and a half times. One of the... One of the things that always plagued us was um, our budget problems. We were never able to close our budget deficit. Five years in a row, we ran multi-million dollar deficits. Um, and I know what you're thinking. 
you were waiting for me to start talking about budget deficits. I know everybody always does. It's very sexy, uh, but I won't believe the point. We were running budget deficits. I didn't know how to close it myself. I was very honest with folks. I said, look, it's going to require hard work and hard choices. We're going to have to make those choices, but I don't know what they are now. So I come into office in the 24. I don't have all the experience in the world. So I don't have all the answers. What do I have is, is energy. So what did we do? We organized, it's never been done before, budget forums. For the public, we did six for the public. We did six for our own staff. I spent hours preparing them and then three hours running each of them. Exhausting marathon sessions where we poured over every line in the budget. I explained exactly where the dollars were going and I asked for their feedback about what should go and what should be cut. It required an inordinate amount of energy, but the plan that we came up with restructured our government, collapsed and merged departments for the first time in over 85 years. We actually restructured way, the way we did things. We got rid of redundant layers of bureaucracy. We were able to close our first budget deficit with no layoffs and the lowest tax increase in 15 years. Right? It was, yes, ma'am, thank you. And, we, and, and it wasn't experience that did it. In fact, in a lot of ways, it was ignorance that did it. Because I didn't have the answer, I had to go out and find it. And I found it uh, in the people that I said, applying your energy towards these problems can help us. So it's energy, and I told you the second one was creativity, and the third is moral authority. Now, creativity is so important because the reason uh, our problems exist is because they haven't been solved before. Right? Sounds so, sounds right? common sense. If a problem exists now, it's because it hasn't yet been solved. So continuing to think the same way about that problem is only going to uh, make it worse. Right? What we need is a young person's ability to, you ever, um, anybody here like babysit or have young siblings? They like watch, yeah. So you ever watch little kids play? You ever watch like a little, like a six-year-old say, you watch her say, she'll say, uh, I'm a dinosaur, right? And in what happens in the moment? There's two incredible things. First, in her mind, in that moment, she is literally a dinosaur. Right? She believes that she's a dinosaur. Right? What's even more incredible? What do all the little kids who are around her do? They get the hell out of there. Yeah, yeah, they run away. They think there's a dinosaur there. Right? That, do you understand what's happening in their minds? when that, the, the leap of creativity that that requires. An ability to decide, consciously decide, that the reality you're presented with is no more important and no more permanent than the reality that you imagine. That the status quo is not as precious as a future that could be brighter. I'll give you a, a real life example of how this works in it. As I mentioned, um, things were drab and morale was low. When, when money's tight, nobody's happy. Nobody's happy. Uh, our employees hadn't been getting raises. Some of them had lost their jobs. Uh, people hadn't seen positive civic improvements in their neighborhoods in a long time. There were a lot of potholes. As I said, the commons were run down. So we applied creativity to these problems. And the first thing I needed to do was convince people to look at our world a different way. So I have a parking space in front of my office, uh, which is dope, right? I have it that says, uh, reserved for mayor. It's a sense of reserved for mayor. And it's right there in front of the city. And uh, uh, I sold my car like four years ago. So I live in it, so I'm a hippie, right? Um, the grown-ups here get that. Uh, so I'm, or I'm environmentally conscious, so I sold my car. So what do I do with the parking space? Right? My friends were parking in it, I couldn't have it. So I decided to do something. We took two benches that we weren't using. We took a tree that already had to be cut down. We sliced it into rings, hollowed it out, filled it with soil, planted flowers in it, bring this back. And uh, um, we created the smallest park in the city of Atlanta, in my parking space. And what did it cost? It cost the $40 that it took to add a sign, that a sign that said, reserved for mayor, now underneath it, it says, and friends. Which is very nice, because I see an enemy sitting out there, I say, get out of here, right? it's just friends. Um, this was the most popular thing I've ever done. I just told you that long story about closing the budget and the deficits with the tax increases and, the, and it took 12 months to figure it out and all that hard work. 
if you ask an Ithaca, you say, what do you think of the mayor? You know what they'll tell you? Oh, the parking space guy. Okay, that's me. Right? It's incredibly popular. Why? Because it was creative. It took what was a parking space and it made it a people place. And it reimagined an age-old problem that all cities and all communities have, which is, where are we going to put our cars? We had been asking for far too long the wrong question. We had been approaching our problem without creativity. What if our problem wasn't that there weren't enough parking spaces? What if the problem was that there were too many cars? Even to get people thinking about that simple problem in a different way has allowed us to take space, which was one, once relegated for cars, and turn them into people places. We've allowed now for infill development that's created construction jobs, created places for people to live, expanded our tax base, which has helped us keep our taxes low, created a more vibrant, financially and culturally healthy city. We've also sparked another wave of creativity. People inspired by my apartment space got together and they said, what other public spaces can we reimagine? And they took a look and they found these electrical boxes in the city. Now, I don't know if you know what an electrical box is, but you've passed a thousand of them, probably without even noticing. There are these silver boxes about this wide, about this tall, and on almost any corner where there is a traffic signal, you'll see these. Right? So just look at the next light pole that you go by and you'll see one of them. They're silver, they're very dull. They're a part of urban life and dense urban living that people find unattractive. Just another little bit of minutia that decays the aesthetics of our world and has a subconscious of impact on our perceived quality of life. What did they do? They painted them. And they didn't just paint them any colors, they had a contest. And they said, we're going to paint 21 of these. And you can submit your proposal. We had over 50 artists submit. They painted these boxes, and we've turned our entire city into an, uh, an outdoor museum. Art museum. Right. And again, change the way people look at public space, and change the way they think about what's possible, particularly on a shoestring budget. That kind of creativity applied to our problems at the local, and state, and federal level is what we need if we're going to break the log jams that keep families locked in poverty, to keep kids away from affordable educations. If we're going to be successful, we need that kind of creativity, and you have it. And the final thing we need is moral, a moral authority, a moral clarity that young people have acutely. That belief that there is right and there is wrong and there is a responsibility to uphold and defend that which is right and to avenge that which is wrong. Young people have that, like, the, remember the six-year-old, the dinosaur? Um, if you were to take something away from her, unfair, belong to her, but you stole it. Right? Has anybody ever done it, like uh, those of you who have babysat? You ever take something away from a little kid? Yeah. Why? Monsters? Why would you do that? No, okay. All right. um, you take it away. It's unfair. So what do they say? That's not fair. Oh, you did the voice. Who did the voice? They said, that's not fair. And what did the grown-up say? Was that you? What did the grown-up say? Oh, look at all these grown-ups. <laughs> you hear that? Remember that? Life isn't fair. Now, we're all grown-ups here, apparently, because we all know that, but remember when you were six and seven years old? I really remember. I remember how many of you have, have had your parents, your guardians, your teachers, your older siblings say that to you? Life's not fair. All of us have. Right? How did that, how did you feel? Mad. I, it's, it's beyond that. Right? It was pissed, thank you. There was a heat in your chest and in your stomach. There was a fire that told you. If at six years old, if you could say, a world full of injustice does not excuse any one particular injustice. Now, you can't, it's you can't, so you don't. You just hold your breath until you get the lollipop back. Right? Uh, which is a good management technique. I do that uh, with myself a lot. You still have that acute sense that just because the world has never been fair doesn't mean it can't become fair. That 
a world full of injustices still does not excuse any one particular injustice. That rainforest being decimated matters even if it's half a world away. The children who cannot read in the fourth grade matter even if they're not your children. That people who don't have access to the medical care they need to stay alive without pushing themselves into bankruptcy matters, even if that's the system we've always had. You still have that moral authority, that moral clarity, because you haven't been scarred by a thousand battles waged and lost, a hundred compromises made. You don't have calluses on your soul yet. That freshness, that clarity is missing in government today, and you can bring it back. You can combine that with your energy and your creativity, and you can lead us. You really can. As the Bible said, a, a, a child shall lead them. You can lead us into a brighter future. We need you to do that. Because truth is, uh, in our country, concerted efforts by people of all ages, ethnicities, and classes are the only things that's ever made large differences. So we need you now, uh, and I hope you will. Any questions? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we'll take Q&A for, I, for as, long as, as long as you have questions. Yes, sir. Um, how do you motivate your staff? Because you putting all that work and get the budget. To, yeah, um, beer. No, okay, no, no, no. okay, no, I get it, I get it. How, you know, the question was, how, do I, how did I motivate a staff to put in all, this is one of the hardest questions in all of management, and particularly in government, when uh, a lot of times you don't have, you can't just fire somebody if you don't like their performance. There's all sorts of uh, laws and restrictions on how you can handle your staff. So you really do have to motivate them. So thank you for using that word, how do I motivate them to, to do all that extra work? The first thing you have to do is you have to lead by example. People just will not follow um, uh, a hypocrite. They will not follow a hypocrite. If you ask them to work hard, uh, if you ask them to sacrifice, and then they watch you go home early, they'll never do it again. Never do it again. But if they watch, if they see that you are at the office even later than they are, that you come in earlier, and that you're as willing to stand in front of the public and, and answer as many questions as the public could ask, um, then they'll have you back. So that is the biggest thing. The second is really um, telling them, a, drawing them a picture of where we're headed, painting a picture so they can actually see it and understand it. Uh, um, and this is a very, sort of a very obvious motivational technique. What, what would, if I said to you, um, hey, come and get in the car, we're going to get ice cream, and then after that we're going to move in, and then we'll come back here and I'll drop you off. Right? Or if I just said, hey, get in the car. Right? Which is more persuasive? The first one, right? Because she likes ice cream, right? The first one's more persuasive because you understand where you're going. And, and you can visualize it in your head. And the more detail you can add, it's going to be chocolate and, and vanilla ice cream. It's going to be a swirl and a large cone. And then we're going to see the Lego movie at 3.30. It's playing at 3D. It's got good reviews. We're going to see it. The more you can do that, the more you can motivate first your friends to hang out with you, which is good to so use that technique. Um, but also, the more you can tell your staff. In 2015, you're going to be a city that's financially solvent. You're going to see your raises come back. We're going to be able to do this, and we're going to be able to do that. And we can only do it if we take these steps today. Right? So painting that picture and setting an example, I find are the best ways to, uh, to motivate. And then honestly, um, read out poor performance. Whatever you have to do. Firing people is extremely hard for poor performance, but, uh, but we've done it, I've done it in the last two years. Um, and then the folks who can't fire, you can motivate to leave, either by letting you know, letting them know what you expect, and letting them know when they're not living up to expectations. So uh, if somebody continually hands in late work, you say, listen, your work is always late. Um, make, just make their life uncomfortable until they decide to move someplace else. Now that sounds callous. It sounds like kind of like a, a hard thing, but your nothing will demotivate your employees faster than seeing that 
um, a lack of work is never punished, right? Because nothing sucks more than, you guys have done like group projects or class projects, right? Where you do all the work, because I know you do, right? You do all the work, and somebody else doesn't carry their load. And you all get the same grade. Right? That's demoralizing. Um, so for the good of the workforce, it's, it's important to weed out that out. Good question, thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. has been my motivation from the time I was five until now. Um, it changes. You know, I, 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 there was a moment when I was 16 or 17 when I understood, uh, I came to understand two things. One, how um, important government had been in my own life. Realizing that there was somebody paying for that free lunch, and it was the government. There was somebody who paid public school teachers. There were people who paved the road so that I could go to school. Understanding that made me see the government was important. Um, the second thing was realizing that government was run by people. That they actually existed. You know, you, you know what I'm talking about when I say they? You ever complain about something that's wrong in your school or in your, your community? You ever, see, you ever need to say this? You know, they need to make the school lunches tastier. Right? They need to make the lockers bigger. They need to fix those potholes in the roads. Most people just assume they is all, like there's just one group of, there's like five people somewhere who's making all of these decisions about your school lunches and whatever. They actually exist. They are out there. Sometimes it's your school board, sometimes it's your city council, sometimes it's your state government, uh, or your federal government. But there are people out there making those decisions and you can be one of them. So once I understood that, I, I knew at that moment what motivated me was giving back to the system that gave me so much giving back to a government that had served me so well uh, became my motivation, and I wanted to become one of them. Uh, I have a young lady and a gentleman. What are your biggest worries when you Oh my goodness. Chess, what was one of my biggest worries when I entered the office? You know, something that never goes away I can tell you about all sorts of policies. You know, I worry about money. I worry about money all the time. We don't have enough. We always need more. Um, but my true worry, the one that's debilitating, uh, is I'm worried that people won't like me. Uh, and that sounds silly. It, it is, you know, and it is silly. Uh, it's not my job to be like. So. One of my biggest challenges is overcoming that fear and that worry every day that I go into work. To say, some people will like me, some people won't like me. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm running an organization that seeks to improve the lives of the people who live in the city. That's what I'm doing. So don't worry about your popularity. Don't worry about what people say about you. Don't worry about how you perceive. Uh, that's, uh, that's a challenge. Because it's, you know, if I can be honest with you, people say mean things. And it sucks, you know? But people will say mean things like right to your face, as if you don't have feelings. And then they, you could get 10 compliments one day, you get one insult, and three weeks later you're gonna wake up in the middle of the night and be like, am I really a jerk? Am I a jerk face? She said I was a jerk face. You're gonna call your mom, like, mom, I'm not a jerk face, am I? And she says, no, so you're not a jerk face. Um, so yeah, if I can be honest with you, that's a, yeah, that's a worry or a challenge. Yes, sir? That's good question too. You guys don't have any softball questions? <laughs> so what would I recommend to the college students? Um, find a mentor. It could it could be somebody your age. Uh, it will most likely be somebody older. It could be a professor. It could be a staff member. For me, it was a staff member. Right? It could be a, a, a custodial staff member. Find somebody who has a trait or a characteristic that you lack, but you want. Right? That's something you can learn from. What I did is I found people who were so comfortable speaking in public. That was always my biggest fear. Public speaking was my biggest fear of the study. Uh, which is not unusual. You know, it's, uh, it's a Seinfeld joke, but it's true. You said that the number one fear um, in America is public speaking. 
And number two fear is death. Right? It's pretty deep. That means that if there were a funeral, more people would rather be in the casket <laughs> than giving the eulogy. Right? That's, that's why. Um, so I found people who were very comfortable with themselves, very comfortable speaking in public, and in moments when I'm nervous, you know what I'll do straight up? I will pretend to be them. I will do an imitation of them, right? Uh, until I feel comfortable again being myself. So if I could give any advice, it's to find that mentor. Because not only will they help you develop skills that you need, they're going to lead you through the landmines in life. Uh, and there are a lot of landmines that you're not going to see on your own. That, that you'll hit because you don't have the experience to navigate around them. And finding somebody with that experience can help make your life much, much easier. Yes, sir? Was it hard to get respect being a younger man? Yeah, being a, yeah he asked, uh, was it hard to get respect being a young man? Particularly from like staff? Is that what you mean? From, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, especially at first, they were skeptical. You know, most of the people that I, I supervised directly were between 35 and 40 years older than me when I took office. Um, what, what is that? So what do you do about it? Well, first is um, you just show them how your youth can be uh, a strength as well as a, as a weakness. Right? So you show them your energy, you show them your creativity, you show them your moral authority. And they'll see, okay, so there's some benefits to this whole young mayor thing. Um, the second thing you can do is show them that you're aware of your own blind spots. So the more I acknowledge, look, I've been around as long as you have. You know more about this than I do. You know more about parking drivers. You know more about crime fighting. You know more about putting out fires than I do. So I need you um, to help me understand more. If you can demonstrate to them you're aware of your weaknesses, that helps. But the truth is, the thing that helped the most is time. As with anybody, um, the first thing you, no you notice about somebody is what you can see about them at first blush. So when I walk into a room, it's, okay, it's a young uh, male of color. Right? It's a young black guy. So you now know three things about him. Shake your hand, you're like, okay, he's right hand. That's like a fourth thing. Uh, I tell you that I'm a Pisces. Now you know I'm a Pisces, right? And as you begin to expand your understanding of somebody, after you've worked with them for six months, all of a sudden, in your mind, those three things, that they're young black male, or that they're an old um, white male, but that they're a, a middle-aged Asian woman, right? those become less important. And when you think of them, you think punctual, organized, right? energetic, or you think um, constantly late, disorganized, whatever. Their demographics disappear to the background, and who they are becomes more important. So with time, I gain the respect of my staff, most of my staff. I don't, you have to ask them, um, but it just takes time. Yes, ma'am. If I had failed, I knew I could not fail. Outside of being mayor, what would I accomplish if I knew I could not fail? Be point guard for the next, I think. <laughs> Like a youth, right? I couldn't do any worse than Raymond Felton. I mean, <laughs> what is he here? What are you? What is he here? I'm sorry. No, Raymond Felton's cousin is here. It was awful. Um, <laughs> what would I? What would I accomplish? My goodness. You know, one um, one passion of mine is is food, food security and uh, food sustainability, because we didn't always have enough food growing up. And I remember the, uh, how awful a feeling that was, um, particularly for my mom, to have that kind of stress to know that you're working as hard as you can work, making minimum wage, right? So you can work in two jobs, you make $22,000 a year, you gotta feed five people. Your paycheck runs out by Wednesday, your food stamps run out by Friday, and you don't get paid again until Monday. So what do you do that weekend? Kids aren't at school. You have three meals a day right, times three days. Any math majors here? <laughs> That's nine times five months. Right? You have to come up with 45 meals and you have no money. That kind of stress 
is, uh, is unbearable. And if I could do anything, it would be to change uh, the way we grow our food in this country, the way we distribute it, and the way we make sure, or the or failure to make sure that everybody has the nutrition that they need. Um, so if I could do anything, be sure that I won't fail to be reforming our food system. What did I study in college? I studied communication and sociology, uh, and I minored in beer. Uh, no, I, I, kid, I don't. I didn't. I never drank in college or okay, uh, a single beer, and I would encourage you not to either. You two can become men. <laughs> of a different city, not of Ithaca. Not of Ithaca. Um, uh, yeah, I studied communication, and, uh, and I loved it. It was great. Did you follow? I would love to stay. So, so his question was, do I um, plan on moving to the federal level, or would I like to stay as mayor? You know, the truth is, I'd like to stay as mayor for as long as long as I can. It's the coolest job in government. It's the sweet spot where you actually can have an impact, um, but you are still grounded. Right. So, my roommate ran for Congress last year. And uh, it was awful. You spent six hours a day locked in a room, a tiny room, this room the size of the closet, just calling people and raising money. And I was like, this can't be the way. That's exactly what every one of our congressmen and women do every day. Not just during a campaign, because the campaign is never ending. They do that every day, six hours a day, calling strangers, complete strangers on the phone and asking them for money. Now, if that doesn't worry you about the state of our government, it should. Because if you're doing that six hours a day, you know what you're not doing? Working, right. You're not doing any work for the people. Right? So um, at that level, you know, it's very frustrating. You want to 500 people. But here, when you're mayor, you can uh, you get a call about a pothole. You call down to DPW you say, fix the pothole. And when you leave work that day, you look at it. You walk right past it and say, boom, there's a pothole. I did something. Right? You can feel effective. And um, people call you mayor. They like like little kids will wave at you like you're famous across the street. And say hey mayor, you're like ah, you know it's very um, it's cool. It's got all the cool stuff about being in government without uh, well it's still got some share of nonsense, but without a lot of the nonsense that comes with serving at the upper levels. Yes sir. Um, I don't really know how it works until you got in office, but here there's a lot of um, problems with party lines, mm. Democrat Republican. Um, and I assume that you have to do something to break through those party lines to get everything how it is in it. Mm. Yeah, and, and our party lines are different. It's a very liberal place. So we have Democrats and we have socialists. <laughs> <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> Not kidding. Uh, <clears throat> um, and we have the, it, parties are a problem because, because no party has a monopoly. Our president, President Obama often says, no party has a monopoly on the truth. And if you are trying to stick within a party and stay within those lines, you're going to find yourself ignoring truths and f chasing the wrong solutions only because uh, the right answers happen to be owned by another party. So, I believe, as mayor, former mayor of New York City, Ed Koch, used to say, that there's no Democratic or Republican way to pick up the trash. Mm -hmm. right? At a municipal level, it's about getting the work done. Can you keep people safe? Can you keep their homes from burning down? Can you pick up the trash? Can you keep the streets plowed? That has nothing to do with party. So what I stress, what I try to do, is keep ideology out of it, and even um, intentionally. You know, I wouldn't answer questions about larger issues in Ithaca, we like to do this thing where, you know, somebody's running for mayor. So you're going to be in charge of the police department and the fire department. So what kind of questions do people ask you at a debate? Of course, they want to know your position on the war in Iraq. Right? <laughs> and, you, and you have to say, you have to say, look, I know those are the problems that divide us at the national level. But what unite us here are all the same. We want communities that are beautiful. We want communities that are safe. 
but we want environments that allow us to pursue lives of purpose and satisfaction. And that has, that's not a democratic, republican, or socialist value. That's a human value. Yes, sir, in the back. This is, to me, our biggest problem. This question was, folks who are always afraid of change, especially in government, how do you deal with traditionalists or reactionaries, which I think is, a, a, is, is an appropriate word too. First, you've got to convince people that the future will be brighter than the present. The way to do that is to paint a picture again, as specific as possible. When we rebuilt our downtown, you can't just tell people what you're going to do. You have to show it to them. You have to show it to them again and again. You have to walk them through it. We created 3D models of what it was going to look like so that people could see it from every angle. They could become convinced that this work was going to be worth it. Um, but you also have to do a fair amount of, what you need is uh, what, what Plato called ethos, credibility. As a leader, you have to have credibility because you're going to be asking people, to, to, to take a leap. You're going to be asking people to jump into the unknown. And if you've proven yourself again and again, they'll follow you. Right? If you are credible, they will follow you. So how do you build credibility when you have none? Well, you start small. Start with something uh, as small and as silly as turning a parking space into a park. Small and it's silly, but it takes a little work. You don't have to have a lot of credibility to do it. Once you do it, you have just as much credit you do something like bringing fireworks back to the city. We hadn't had fireworks celebration in our city in a long time. It's a small thing and a silly thing, but it's something that was important to me. And particularly when morale is low, it's something that I thought could bring us together, that chance to all get together for free. There's no VIP seating. Right? There's, no, um, there's no valet parking. It's just the night sky. It belongs to all of us. But we're all looking up at it at the same time to bring that back as we did in our first year. And to raise the money from the people in that Again, gives you just a little bit more credit. As you do those small things, you now have the credibility that you need to again tear up the center of your downtown and completely rebuild it. Or to allow $200 million of private growth to happen. Because when people come to you and say, I'm scared, things are changing very fast, I feel uncomfortable about it. You can say, um, I haven't led you wrong well yet, I need you to trust me and come with me. And uh, they'll do it. And when they won't do it anymore, then you need to uh, polish up your resume and start to look for, start to look for work elsewhere. Maybe dog catcher or something. Uh, yes? Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So we have um, something called Comets. It's, a, it's an outdoor pedestrian mall. Right? So in the center of our downtown, there's no cars allowed. Uh, we, we have trees, and we have pavilions, and we have benches. And uh, it was very nice in 1971 when it was first built. But over four decades, it's deteriorated, it's crumbled, and the water and the sewer lines underneath uh, were way too old. Our a water line will last 50 years. Uh, this year is our water main's 102nd anniversary, which, was very, which we're very happy for it, and we're very happy to get it out of there, because when it breaks, um, it's going to be a mess for us. So we had to replace the underground utilities and completely mess up everything. Now, how do you do that? Because even though everybody knew it was shabby, you have 250 businesses directly on the continents who would be impacted by any construction, not to mention all the people who live there, would be impacted by the noise. And if you're younger than 40 years old, the only thing you've known on the commons has been the way it currently looks. So you don't want to see it change, and you want to really go. So how do you get that kind of buy-in? Uh, we did a few things first. Um, first, uh, we invited the public to be part of the design process, and not for a two-hour-long public meeting, but for a six-month-long. Every other week, we met with some designers that we hired, 
and the public themselves made the choices about where the playground would go, where the fountain would go, where the pavilion would go, what kind of trees we would use, what kind of lights we would use. So already, you have a segment of the population, the segment that's, that's most interested anyway, invested in the design because they feel like they made the choices, which they didn't. The second thing you do is you bring in as much outside money as you can. This project's going to cost $15 million. Right? Now, people are a little scared of by that number, but they're also, they don't want to spend that much money on something they're not even sure that they want in the first place. So you can reduce that fear by raising money, and that takes, for us, a bit of creativity. Uh, we had to go, uh, I went to the private sector and raised $500,000 from them. Then I went to the state government and raised $2 million from them. And then I went to the federal government and we raised $4.5 million from them. Okay, so we raised um, $7 million, almost half of this project cost from outside funds. So now all of a sudden for the people in Ithaca, it, it, this starts to look like a really attractive thing to do, and to do it right now while this money exists and before it expires. And then the last thing you can do is to mitigate all of the things that people fear are going to go wrong. Right, so we came up with a 32-point mitigation plan for our businesses and for our residents. What were we going to do? Instead of working typical construction hours, where you'll do eight hours of construction work a day, five days a week, we did 10 hours a day, four days a week. We still get 40 hours worth of work done. But what that means is that on Friday, there'd be no work. We could advertise on the radio and on TV, which we did, that come down for construction-free Fridays <laughs> on the Ithaca counties, right? You can also put money aside, which we did, $500,000 worth of uh, um, emergency loans for businesses who could bring in their sales receipts and showed us that in the months leading up to the work they were making money but in the months after the work started they began to lose it they would qualify for emergency loans that would keep them in operation until the end of the project you could spend a little bit more which we did that's why we spent the money to do the project in 20 months instead of the projected 36 months right so you hurry it up so that the whole thing um, goes by quicker you can invite people to participate in the project in a way that will also beautify it. So a typical construction project, you put up fences. Maybe you cover it with orange tarp if you want to get fancy. But we did something else here. We actually we spent, again, a little bit more money on 300 canvases, large canvases. This big. But we did a contest for artists to come out. And everybody from the elementary school kids to senior homes participated. And we had 300 different murals. We still have them up right now. 300 different murals lining the construction. What does that do? It itself becomes an attraction. People want to come down to see the artwork. And you now have 300 members of the public who own a piece of the commons, who themselves want to bring their family and their friends to show off what they did, but also want to root for the project because they're invested in it. You do all of those things, and what will happen is the business community hangs in there. We haven't had a single business um, go, go out of business. In fact, we haven't even had a single business apply for the emergency loans. And we went from having a vacancy rate on the commons of 20%, it's now 3%. 3% vacancy. We've had businesses open up during the construction. Right? So what it requires frankly, is a whole lot of creativity, doing things that have never been done before. One of the things we did, too, is a race for the space. Um, we went to these landlords that had some of these vacancies, vacant storefronts, and we said, um, give, us, give those to us um, for free. And they said, uh, no. <laughs> we said, let us explain. Here's what we're going to do. And they bought it, and here's what we did. We got one um, storefront was going to be rent free for six months. One storefront was going to be rent free for, for a year, and one was going to be rent free for three months. And we invited people to send their business plans to us. We had 40 business plans come in. We had a panel of judges judge the business plans, and the very best business plan got a year's worth of rent free in one of those storefronts. The second best, six months. The third best, three months. Why did the landlords agree to that? Because we now have 37 other great business plans on hand. We have people that we know are interested in opening businesses on the commons. And we know that they have an idea and that that idea is well-developed enough for them to have an actual written business plan. 
over the proceeding, over what has now been the last year, we worked with each of those businesses to help them find whatever it was they needed. Some of them needed financing. Some of them needed to fine tune their idea. Some of them needed to just find the right space. And from that, 12 other businesses have now opened in our paying grant, often to the very same landlords who are giving away uh, some space for free. Right. So uh, by creating that little tiny incentive, we've lifted all these boats up. It takes that kind of energy and creativity to, to uh, which ties into your question, so overcome people's fears of change. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. I'll take you to the Is that a Wolverine shirt? Dope. Yes, yes, ma'am. One of my favorite leadership quotes is that leadership is not about title or position, it's about action and example. And I take my hat off to you, sir, for making that. of SUNY Sullivan have a small gift for you as a token of our appreciation and it fits in with our mission of sustainability yeah. we do usually we try to avoid bottled water but we didn't have time to wash this for you <laughs> but this is a traditional SUNY Sullivan coffee mug oh my so, goodness thank you. Thank, you. thank you I'm going to stay with thank you thank you I really appreciate that thank you thank you I'm oh, sorry I, I so was and I just wanted yes. to ask you Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but I think leaders are... And I only ask that question because I'm, I'm representing like what's going to do with the Delaware Valley Job Corps, and I'm a peer leadership uh, coordinator. That's one of the questions I always ask them when I have, and it's amazing, you know, the different answers. So I want to know you, since you are a leader, are they native or Oh, my goodness. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I think they're mayors. I do think they're made, and I'll tell you why. Um, you can be born with certain traits that will make you a good leader. What traits will make you a good leader? If you're stubborn, um, if you're persistent. Uh, but most of what you need to keep you going is going to come from the world around you. Leadership is not glamorous. It is not glamorous. It looks glamorous from the outside. Sometimes, not even all the time, but sometimes. You look at a mayor or you look at a, a, a president of an organization, you think, man, that's the job, that's the life. You know, we must have it so good. But this is, this is work that will keep you up at night. Now, that sounds like a cliche, but I, I don't know if you, how many of you have ever been worried about something so much that you lay in bed staring at the ceiling, but you wake up in the middle of the night and how unpleasant that is, that feeling. Well, you get elected mayor, you're signed up for four straight years of sleepless nights. Um, it is not fun, and it's, you certainly don't do it for the money, I can tell you that. Um, or the perks, because there's only one perk, it's a parking space, so I gave it away, I have an idiot. <laughs> no, sorry, I also get a bus pass, I get a bus pass. Unlimited bus pass. Uh, so it's not for the perks, so it's got to be, if you're going to be a leader, you have to find a motivation. And you can't be born with that motivation. You can't, you know, that motivation is not within you. It's got to come from a passion for serving other people. So I think leaders are made because they're made, as I said earlier, by their friends. Any other questions? I, I want to thank you. Uh, honestly, this is such a pleasure for me to. Um, I'm a middle child. I, I think I told you. So, uh, so nobody ever listened to me. Uh, so to have you all uh, come here and listen and listen to all the time, it's not the to me. So thank you so much. What is the most important thing that schools can do to help students who are experiencing homelessness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the most important thing schools can do to help students who are experiencing homelessness? Um, that is one hell of a question. I think the best thing you can do for uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness is not even within the realm of schools. It's to find them a place to live. It doesn't matter what it costs. 
build it. Build it, put them in there. Why? Because you need stability. If you don't know where you're going to sleep that night, you are not going to learn calculus. You are not. There's no way to help children succeed if they don't know where they're going to get off the bus or who's going to pick them up from school. Um, but what can schools do for people who are struggling with hardcore poverty? So maybe they are, they do have homes. One of the best programs um, that I remember and uh, I was so touched by was uh, a backpack lunch program where uh, my school would pack lunches for Saturday and Sunday, because I knew I was going to be in school and I wouldn't be able to eat on those days. And they slipped them while you were playing at recess, whatever, they slipped them into your backpack. The other kids don't see it. Uh, what that does for a family in need is beyond, it's beyond nutrition. It's, uh, um, it's salvation. And, and uh, the more we can do that for our, for our mothers. The stronger kids we build. And the stronger kids we build, the fewer families will have uh, living, living in poverty. So, um, and focusing on, on stability, getting kids a place to live, and making sure they're fed is uh, the best thing schools can do. Uh, I think that's a good question. Thank you, because it'll help me compose myself. I can be such a weirdie sometimes. Uh, uh, the arts are, I, I told you that my parents, my grandparents were teachers. Well, my grandpa was a music teacher, and my uh, grandma was a librarian. Um, and so we grew up with art in the home, and I've got to tell you that it is not insubstantial. One of the largest fallacies we have is that Math matters and music doesn't. Uh, science is, is the key to happier and healthier lives, but the, the painting is a hobby. Um, we are not here just to survive. We're not. We're not. We don't wake up and eat three meals a day and hit our pillow at night and say, hmm, survived 24 more hours. Yeah, how's that? My heart's still beating? Great. That's not what we're here for. We're here to find beauty, to find love, to find um, acceptance, fulfillment, satisfaction, and then to leave some of that beauty, love, acceptance, fulfillment, satisfaction behind for other people to find. We're here to live, not just to survive. And the arts, what life is all about, it's what it's all about. And in our city, it seemed that it has been ignored for a very long time. We didn't have any public murals. We didn't have any public art. We didn't have flowers planted in our flower boxes. We brought all of that back, even in the midst of a recession, because what is the point of being financially solvent if you're going to live a life of drabness? There is no point to live in a city that can pay all its bills, but is not a joy to live in. There isn't. There's no point. So um, we've encouraged the arts. And the arts, in turn, attract people. We have people who start businesses in Ithaca who have no, no good reason to start a business in Ithaca. Right? It's far away from just about everything. It's cold as hell. You know, it snows too much. Uh, there's no throughway. But they want to start a business there because it's a, it's a city that's culturally vibrant. So it, it's its own reward. All right. Thank you so much. On behalf of SUNY Sullivan and Sullivan Renaissance, we would like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, what you saw today will be available on the Sullivan Renaissance website, so if you know people who may benefit from Mayor Myrick's talk today, please let them know. Uh, we'll, it'll be up in a, in a short while. It won't be up right away. But if you are not doing anything tomorrow or you know some other folks who really should hear the message, please encourage them to join us at the CVI building in Ferndale where Mayor Myrick will be the keynote speaker for our annual conference. Slightly different talk, but really the same 
underlying message. So thank you again. And there are still some snacks and refreshments, I believe, in the lobby. So please help yourself on the way out. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you.